What's the big idea? All right, and we're back. We're yeah. here on another episode of Volleyballgy. Uh, my name is Zuby. My name is Eric. And there's no Amici. Oh. Yeah, Amici chose uh, to celebrate his... <laughs> get this, everybody. Amici chose to celebrate his daughter's birthday instead of hanging out with us. Because <laughs> he's, uh, he, I guess, you know, we thought we were family, but, you know, live and learn. Yep. Yeah. 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 <laughs> no, yeah, happy birthday to uh, Meech's child. We won't say Meech's child's name for okay. Meech's privacy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so it's just uh, Eric and uh, Zuby here today for Volleyballgy. And this episode, we are going to uh, dig into part two of our parents' Q&A session that we had. These were questions that came to us through our Facebook page uh, at Volleyballgy and through our uh, email, info at volleyballgy.org. Uh, the website is... Uh, volleyballg.org by the way if you've never been there and uh, these are questions that parents wrote in to us um, that they uh, would like to have clarification on of course if you have any questions or any show ideas for us feel free to do the same Uh, you can uh, email us or uh, write us those uh, links are in the description of the video or you can put them in the comment section if you're watching on YouTube Um, we love to uh, we love to talk so you know we have lots of things that we can uh, we can uh, tell you about Mm -hmm. so Eric are you ready today yeah Anything going on in life maybe we should talk about first or? Mm, I don't know. Nothing? Okay, no. good. Yeah. yeah, same here. Not much? Yeah, just kids <laughs> playing volleyball season now and it's going pretty well. We're having a good year. So I don't I don't want to, I'm excited to say that uh, this is the first year. My daughter's playing on an 18-year-old team. She's 17. And uh, first year we're having a good a good time. It looks mm-hmm. like, I mean, it's probably jinxing it, but mm-hmm. the coach for the first time since she was 12 doesn't seem like a, mm-hmm. like a, a bit of a nut job. Mm. <laughs> it's a true story and the parents are all pretty good attitude yeah um all the players like each other there's no drama and the coach is helping you know maintain that lack of drama which is good uh so yeah it's pretty rare but it does happen parents so i'm here to tell you and it's early it's early in our club season up here but um it could happen so uh but yeah that's what's going on so we just had a tournament this weekend they did pretty well yeah they had, had a good time yeah, really good time, didn't they? Yeah, the players just finally had that together. moment of crazy cohesion, and um, and, and it was in playoffs too, right? Yeah, well, it's good. It's just good that they all just you can tell. Like we talked about this in one episode, they have hope. You know, that's all any player has. So there's no negativity. Yeah, e- even the players. There are players on the team who play a lot less, but it's very, the coach actually put them in uh, in pretty serious situations. Um, yeah, even in that. Um, the the gold medal game they the player went in at a critical time and everybody was like a little nervous for her nice uh, because you know you don't want them to you know feel responsible for a loss but they pulled it out uh, and it was great yeah. and she was on the court for the gold medal win even though she's hasn't she you know she even missed some practices so she the coach handled that well too right um you know there like she there was a consequence for missing practices yeah and then also when she got in and struggled a bit he protected her a bit got them in you know even took out players in the middle of the games. Like subbed out like some team leaders. Yeah. Put in some backup players who were struggling on the day. Yeah. He also made honestly one of the players who um, uh, is going to play the least probably. He made her team captain, which I thought was really nice. You know. Yeah. And it st- it also gets any problems away from the rest because like some kids are older than others and some of the some of the younger players might be the stronger players on the team. Uh, so to avoid that issue, I think of a younger captain. He just gave it to a player that he thought it really needs a confidence boost, by the way. Yeah. So I think it's kind of cool, right? Yeah. That's a really smart thing to do. Yeah. This guy's an older coach. He's refed for a lot of years and uh, seems to be <clears throat> doing a lot of logical things and letting kids go. And he's open to, by the way, like sometimes he'll, he'll, um, he, he'll, he'll, he knows that I played. So he will ask me some things and, and he legitimately listens and he actually asks for advice and, and mm. uh, even though he knows a lot himself. Mm. Uh, but that's that's what everybody should do, right? Because mm. I, I even, you know, I can learn from him and he can learn from, from me sometimes. And, you know, he's invited me in to come in and help out with practice. Well, yeah, time. like the fact that like you guys uh, continue to have that because sometimes it might be, you know, early on in the season, the coach maybe after one tournament or one practice might ask you for some feedback and then you, you'll give them some feedback. But then like, they'll immediately that'll be like the last time that ever happens because they'll yeah all of a sudden they feel 
deflated or something threatened sometimes yeah yeah, yeah. and yeah. It, like the cool and, thing he doesn't have the ego that's well that's cool. that's yeah. just it yeah. like, and i know the way that you're giving the advice is not in a way that would normally be interpreted as a threat to their position but then um when they you know internalize it that's what it comes out with other coaches right this guy yeah like he's he's an older ref like maybe yeah there's a lot there's a lot um you know, when someone is like listening to your elders, right? Like people are yep. much more humble. Like, yep, yeah, exactly. More life experience, right? Yeah, yeah, that comes across for sure with him, and and that's why I like like he'll has no no problem coming up and asking me after in between games he'll uh, like in between uh, matches he'll come mm. up and ask a question like oh that well, that was what do you think of that or mm. you know, backcourt defense or something like that and you know I'll give my thoughts and I'll you know i'll ask him why he he likes to do things and he'll ask me why mm. i why i do things differently and it's great so it's honestly very shocking and uh <laughs> very happy mm. to see it happen mm. uh in my daughter uh her last year of club because uh she's volleyball crazy and um mm. you know some of these questions might touch on some of these things that have come up along the way for us because it seems to be universal every time people find out we're doing the show they're very um excited that we're providing an avenue for for parents' voice to get out. Not, not a parent's biased view, by the way, right? Because we are coaches ourselves and we are players ourselves. And now I'm in the parent world. Mm -hmm. So I have a neat perspective on all three. And I think parents are super excited that they are not um, just that crazy parent, right? Like some of them are, of course. Mm -hmm. But, mm -hmm. you know, we are providing a voice for people who have legit concerns and nowhere to nowhere to voice them. So mm -hmm. hopefully, hopefully you guys are enjoying these as much as we enjoy doing them and uh, you're sharing them with friends because... I think uh, everybody that I know who's, you know, heard some of the things we've said uh, are singing hallelujah. <laughs> mm. So you want to get to the first question? Yeah. Okay. Sounds yeah, good. Let's do it. So uh, first question today is uh, my son's coach is discouraging him from playing beach volleyball. Uh, why might that be? So have you heard that one before, Eric, about beach? Yeah, I've heard that one before. Um, <laughs> I don't know. There are... A, they probably never played beach. Um, that yeah. could be one thing. So, hundred percent, I agree. They, you know, whatever is unknown is a automatic fear type thing. Um, and then, outside of that, even if, well, yeah, let's say they did play beach, I can't imagine why they would discourage against it, unless in their own personal experiences, like assuming they're like uh, old, an older coach, like between thirty and sixty or something, mm -hmm. they had a. Well, mind you, if they were 30 and 60, beach wasn't that popular back then <laughs> well, when it, they were 18 or so. It was, though, Eric. That's where oh. I'm seeing it wrong. I am between those ages. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, beach was. Beach was um, beach was big. But I know what you mean, to the to the level. Yeah, you're right. For youth volleyball, yeah. Yeah, actually, right. Because, like, it, it, I mean, volleyball isn't a sport that gets a, a huge amount of attention overall in general. But, like, if one were to be, obviously, indoors, is a much more popular one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're right, though. Beach, you're right. Uh, among the youth uh, nationwide. Yeah. And, like, you know, across the U.S., across Canada. You're right, 100%. So, yeah, so, we were we were on the fringe. We were fans that were. Yeah, we that's. Were the diehards. You're right. Yeah. Bye. That's kind of why we, <laughs> that's kind of why we liked it, right? Is because it was that that uh that outlet that freedom it was that counterculture thing you know it's um, it's it's different now just because you know there's there's cameras everywhere and like there's lenses on everything so counterculture is like a difficult thing to even see nowadays but let's say they were a beach player i don't know maybe they had a bad experience or i i, I can't understand why if they were a beach player in the past they would discourage against it so it's yeah. primarily yeah. my primary thing is that they never played it and then they think it's gonna take a it's gonna yeah, they think it's going to develop bad habits in the player when they come back to indoor season or they're going to be, yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> um, but I completely would disagree with it because yeah. in my experience, um, it's it's a it, it makes you a better indoor player. Now, I actually, beach is my favorite way of playing volleyball. Mm -hmm. I started playing indoor and then I got into the beach and now I'm still playing both, yep. but uh, I'm probably more excited to play beach volleyball and there's just so many advantages to it. So what was the original question? Why is the coach say, saying? Yeah, why might that be? But just before you get it, you should probably tell people what, what do you like better about beach? Um, it's the the mental aspect is intensified mm -hmm. big time because um, it's, it's twos, right? So you're touching the ball every other contact obviously and there's no coaching at least in like lower level or like more uh less high level 
tournaments. I guess in youth though, they're they're allowing coaches now, right? Yeah, but Bet- they they ban them from co- they try to ban yeah they try to ban them from talking during uh, right. matches. Yeah. So so yeah, like if you're training and stuff, certainly like in when I was learning, like I was learning with I was playing with other older players, more experienced players. That was my form of coaching. Mm. I never had a formal beach coach. No, I did for. I did for a season actually when I was trying out for like some high level stuff. Right. So I had some good experiences there. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, the the main thing is it's you're very much on your own, and it's it's amazing the the th- things you learn because you have a teammate and you really notice that you work as one, right? So your energy directly translates into your teammate. And vice versa, um, your teammate um, directly can impact you. So I've definitely played with a number of different types of um, temperamented uh, partners. And I had to, I ended up developing, I don't know what you would call it, social skills or hmm. whatever, to be able to accommodate both. I've had like yeah. very intense, like angry <laughs> teammates. And I kind of had to just absorb that Um and like let them kind of rant and then just accommodate to them and then still get through the game and still be successful. Yep. And then I've had like, obviously I don't prefer playing with someone like that. I noticed that I play better with someone of a equal, more positive. And I probably, probably works for anyone. It's, a, it's <laughs> pretty, succeed. pretty universal. Yeah. Pretty universal. Yeah. So that, that's a, that, that skill alone is like, I mean, it's a form of stress. Mm-hmm. I mean, stress is kind of important for life the type of stress and the intensity and the the frequency of it um that's i think that's where you will split the line of good stress versus bad stress right so mm-hmm. those tournaments when I, the, this was younger when i was playing with a, a partner who was just very intense very mad like yell at yell at me well <laughs> yeah yell at me yell at the ref like you get carded yeah all this stuff like some other the, issues going on for sure. Totally, totally. Mm-hmm. And like at the end of the day, I was pretty exhausted. And then going back to the next tournament or the training session with them, like I'm already in my mind thinking of how to, I'm not thinking about the game. I'm thinking of how can I accommodate them, mm, right? Too um, much energy wasted. Eh? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So so that's that's a, but, but then playing with good partners, right? Then you really can have, you just have a huge amount of fun and you get to push yourself because that's that's what's pushing you is mostly yourself and then you know trying to keep up with your teammates or um, the people you're training against Mm -hmm. so the the mental aspect is just it's amplified and then if you can just stay in that environment you're going to become stronger mentally and then you're also going to become stronger physically i mean we're moving in sand here uh there's a little bit of difference it's probably just because i'm older now like whenever i play uh, beach you know we we came back to the indoor season i guess it's been a few months now mm-hmm. i would typically get things like shin splints but that's because like i'm working a full-time job i'm not really taking the best care yeah, out of my yeah. body yeah and um, it's just you know the lockdowns and i mean lockdowns yeah any, anytime you hit pounding yeah i never had that when i was younger but now but anyways it wasn't too bad the shin splints like we you know we have a bunch of things we can do to deal with stuff like that and Mm -hmm. and my legs are fine now but um yeah so you're gonna get physically i mean faster you're gonna jump higher um you learn you become a much more dynamic attacker Mm -hmm. uh you have to be um, one-dimensional players they can kind of thrive in indoor because indoor is set up to be that way like your opposites are somewhat one-dimensional they are your big hitters Mm -hmm. right um whereas on the beach you know you banging on the ball isn't always going to get you the point right so Mm -hmm. that was a that was a great thing uh mind you still for me i'm still very much yeah i'd rather just smash a ball than make a roll shot but yeah you know if i really want the point if i'm going to be smart or if i'm going to conserve my energy you, know, you need to be, you need to be, or if you're going to play against like great beach players who will block. Yeah. You yeah. 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 <laughs> That's the other thing. That's right? the other thing. There comes a point where you just gotta, yeah, no, I think that, um, we like, can list advantages on and on if you like. Yeah, totally. Like the sun, uh, for the sun, uh, if the coaches discourage, the coaches discourage beach for sure, because they, um, they think that it does teach bad habits. Like you said, I a hundred percent, uh, anybody who gives that advice, was not a serious beach player. Yeah. Uh, because they don't know that, um, the, the, you know, so the, some of the bad habits they would say uh, that it can cause are, um, you know, you don't face past the serve, right? They would say because on beach you can't face past the serve. 
Um, you can, uh, mm. you know, they, they say that instead of tipping it, players will pokey it. They think that because there's two players instead of six, uh, players get out of position. Uh, they start to do their approach from inside the court. Um, lots of things like that. So, so, um, but, <laughs> oh, but the problem is, so the, the proof, um, all of that is absolutely false. So every, mm-hmm. every indoor player should play beach. Not only is it a great way to offset, you know, the damage, like you said, you know, with shin splints and even knee injuries, shoulder problems, beach, yeah. beach is good. Cause you're out in theory, you're in a nice warm place playing and, uh, the sand is much easier to play on. Uh, what you're, you're outside doing in the sun. Yeah. What you're doing <laughs> with your shoulder is different. Um, so it's great for, um, you know, different type. Like, you don't, like Eric said, you don't have to, you know, swing on every ball. Um, it, the number one thing beach players pick up is the ability to read. So like yeah. indoor players, um, they off, they can fall into the trap of, you know, not watching the hitter, watching the ball. And beach players, because there are two of you in the higher level you go, the more uh, you have to start to read and anticipate and cheat on where you think a hitter is going. You also have to remember that that hitter might be faking you out. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. they might just be selling you on a shot down the line and then they're going to turn their hand at the last minute. So Mm -hmm. you can't go too soon. So beach just makes you a much better player in general. And you are learning to set the ball because you have to set. Mm -hmm. And, you know, all players should know how to set. Uh, fairly decently uh, Mm -hmm. out of system stuff indoor anyway so any coach that tells you uh, that beach picks up bad habits they've never played beach because they don't know that every indoor player who plays beach becomes way better and if you don't believe me get six beach players and put them on a six (laughs) six on six indoor Mm -hmm. and the team of six beach players will beat the indoor players every day of the week yeah as long as they've done both like i'm talking about players who've done both obviously um but because uh, they're stronger, they have better endurance, they are training in sand, like Eric said, your vertical is going to be much higher. Uh, they have more shot selection. Uh, they are, you know, playing with six feels very crowded after you come yeah. off the beach, right? And there was a time when I played beach, we were playing on a nine by nine or like a, a full size indoor, indoor court. They shrunk it down now. Um, to uh, eight by eight meters, if we can use meters, I forget the feet thing, but uh, oh yeah, I don't even, <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, we call it eight by eight, <laughs> but uh, the court beach court is smaller now, but nine by nine is thirty, that's thirty nine meters, thirty thirty feet, yeah, something like that, yeah, I don't know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's right, I think you're right, yeah, we, we sound something stupid like now. that, but anyway, um, but uh, so definitely get your children children playing beach if uh if they're not playing beach, get them out there, and the other thing that Eric said that was so true is the freedom. Uh, when you're playing with uh, a coach, even if you have a beach coach, it doesn't matter. They're not going to sub you off. Yeah. So, so the beauty for, especially we talked about, if you haven't heard our Plight of the Tall Player episode, uh, that's a good one because it talks about how they never get to pass indoor. They're getting a little barrowed out at early or earlier ages. So get your kids out on the beach, especially, you know, tall or short, and they will uh, have an opportunity to pass, set, yeah. hit, serve way more often. Think about the reps they're getting at serving. Every other serve is there. Um, so it, the intensity, man, you're, you're locked in and like, you of course get a timeout, but you get one timeout a set, but you are locked in, you know, like if you, it's happened to you, me and you, yeah. um, you make a shank, right. And then you make another shank and you're just, <laughs> and you're just like, Oh my God. And you're like, and now you're thinking, Oh fuck my like yeah. What is my partner thinking? They're probably pissed at me or whatever. Yeah, right? Well, that's the social. I love that you said that about the social thing because the accountability to teammate. Yeah. Is so good. Yeah. Yeah. yeah <laughs> and, and, and there's nowhere to hide. Right. It teaches you mental strength. Like you said, like, yeah, there's nowhere yeah. to hide on the beach. Like everybody there's knows no you're shanking and they're going to serve you again. As long as they're good <laughs> beach players. I've seen beach players forget to keep serving yeah, the player. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah. So. Um, uh, yeah. That's, so exactly. There you go. You you know you identify your advantages, right? Yes. Where to go and like prey on that person, right? Because you know, yeah. you <laughs> we all know now, like if, if you shank one, you're going to get the next serve. Mm-hmm. In right? theory, you should. You should <laughs> some, right? some players, I see, even at the Olympic level, I've seen players like bail players. I don't know why. They shank two balls or a serve yeah, yeah, yeah. and they serve the other player just because the image, I don't know, it's crazy. But, but anyway, so the answer is we both agree. Uh, playing beach is good and coaches who say that you shouldn't play beach uh, you can nod and smile if you say, oh, okay, and then make sure you take your kid out to the beach and play because that's where you get so much. Uh, yeah. You come back in and you'll jump four, you know, three, I will tell people like three, four inches higher indoor. Yeah. Uh, it feels so easy to go back to court after your footing, everything. 
the 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 big thing really is the mental training yeah so much physical and mental like it's crazy indoor becomes so much easier it does make sure yeah just everything is the slow motion indoor after coming back yeah. to the beach you know well the serve feels faster <laughs> the, the indoor serve, serve yeah it can comes yeah. at you faster it can depending on who is serving at you on the beach too. yeah but yeah, the ball the ball right, the ball right, is right. different the ball comes off ball different, different too like yeah. you can much easier i think to shank an indoor serve than a beach yeah. serve yeah like, really badly you know um yeah, depending, right. depending on yeah, yeah it depends you can absorb on the, ball. the ball. You can absorb you can, the beach ball. Better. You can direct the beach ball a bit. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. a bit more forgiving in that sense because because it's it's just two people on an eight by eight. Um, and there's yeah. something cushier about the beach ball. There's something yeah, there's yeah, always, yeah, right, by yeah, design it has to cut through the wind yeah. a little better. So, but then like, and that's just it. You chase down because it's it's like you you and one other person. You chase down everything. So then you do that on the and then all of a sudden yeah the court feels crowded right. Yes yes. You're gonna get way more balls. <laughs> and I don't think I've ever seen a beach player go back indoor and start acting like a beach player. <laughs> like I haven't yeah, seen yeah. anybody run all over the court. Yeah yeah. <laughs> like, yeah like everyone you know knows. You get, the only thing you might forget sometimes you come back from the beach for the first like two practices maybe and you might not face pass a lot of free balls because just on the beach there's a thing you can free ball you can volley a free ball or face pass a free ball yeah. But it's Difficult. just it's just a custom thing that so many players yeah. don't do it because for years it was called, and you know so players mm, coaches mm. just teach young players don't. But one thing that is lost on the beach now is the freedom, like you mentioned about like, and this is why I think coaches don't like it. Indoor coaches don't like it because there's freedom on the beach mm. because that player might meet other players from other clubs and they mm. will hear different things. Yeah. I think a lot of coaches who say that they like they don't they're control freaks. And they don't like that the kid's going to go play volleyball somewhere else that that is you know unregulated or I'm not there or the club's not there. What if they partner with someone from another club? Mm. That, that's their fear, really, right? It'd be a good place to recruit then for a coach who uh, you know go check out the um, the beach scene in the summer. Yeah, yeah, Get would a bunch be, yeah. of players for your next. Well, that's next sort of why season. that's why club team, crazy. That's why a lot of club teams start their own beach programs, right? Because yeah, they're, for they're that worried <laughs> that that if they don't, then they the players will go play with other players from other clubs and other schools, and you know, so it's a whole <laughs> control, control thing. Yeah, it is. It's a weird. That's, that's why what, they. That's we the t- natural progression of anything. It always goes from you know being it's cool snowboarding beach volleyball Mm -hmm. you know like these were goes mainstream different things and then yeah yeah Yeah, it's true it's like it's like our favorite rock bands everybody loves loves a band when they're cool and indie but once they make it they're like no they sold out (laughs) what would you you do but with beach it's uh it still offers a level of freedom the freedom that i like that it offers today is that you can't you won't get subbed out you got got two players there and you're gonna get your reps because you signed up to play beach so that's what i like about it uh, today, so I highly recommend that players go there. It's a great. There's a lot less politics on the beach even today, right? Mm. Because you might not get picked for some of the elite programs, and there might be politics there. Or, you mm. know, but as far as just entering a tournament and playing with a friend, Dude, it's great. You're gonna keep playing if they love it. You, you're gonna play it till I don't know, endless. Yeah, yeah. You can play it longer, right? Yeah. The beach feel- scene is so much fun. It's just a great time. Yep. Yeah, everybody's um, you know wearing less clothes and <laughs> uh, just kidding. Wear wear clothes, kids. Um, okay, next question. Let's go on. Um, my daughter is uh, thirteen, and her coach is all about winning. So he's a very competitive coach. He tells the players to just get it over or bump it back right away to score points. The team is winning a lot. Super competitive. Bump yeah, it over. <laughs> the team is winning a lot, but some players' coaches are criticizing that. So, um, want me to go first on this one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, sure. So, yeah, like sort of Eric hinted at there. Um, I would say that your daughter, 13, yeah, your your daughter's coach probably isn't very competitive really. And, uh, mm. you know, a lot, because I do see this happen a lot with club teams. And uh, I see it on the beach a lot too, where players and parents are cheering for kids when they get points doing, you know, like intentional bump, you know, bump over on one as we would call it or on two and that's fine like you you do see pro beach players do that you never see obviously indoor you ever only see like <laughs> the <laughs> best pros do like could the you best ima- could you imagine seeing an indoor player do it anyway uh but this is an indoor team so um uh so the only yeah you only see beach players do it when there's a real advantage maybe a long rally teams horribly out of position and it's a strategy those players don't need to worry about losing reps so whenever I see young kids doing it on the beach, I just say to that, you know, that young team or that young parent or that parent, uh, you're robbing yourself of reps. You can win lots of games doing the wrong things at young ages, 
but um, you shouldn't be uh, doing that. You, you should be focusing on getting reps and indoor, especially every goal. Yeah. The goal of every rally is three contacts if you can. But if a coach, I've seen this too, where a team bumps it over on one and the coach and the parents are all cheering on and, and it's actually a losing strategy. Yeah. And, you know, people think that that's a competitive coach who wants to win. That's a short term thinking coach who just wants to win now and has no interest in developing the players. Think about it. So that coach is telling them, forget about developing the bumping, yeah, the passing, yeah. the setting, the hitting. Let's just get a gold medal today. It's the equivalent of, you know, eating six Big Macs because you're hungry versus like, oh, I'm going to cook dinner. Yeah. Like there's yeah, one that's yeah. better right now and maybe feels like good. Delay gratification yeah. or a form of yeah. ADD or something or... Long-term thinking. So, <laughs> so yes, that the, the, it is criticized uh, often and the criticism is that it is short-term thinking and it's not really about developing players in long-term and it's a... Honestly, it's a, I think it's a loser strategy. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So... Eric, I don't know if you want to. Well, uh, yeah, uh, just, I don't know. It's pretty pretty straightforward. Yeah. Um, Have you ever had a coach that did that when you were? I don't think so. You, you... No, I've seen it. But uh, yeah. like whenever you look at a highlight reel, you never see. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, again, we're, if we're talking about really smart, experienced players, they might actually see the opportunity to On do beach, a smart. Yeah, on beach. On beach. Yeah, on oh, beach. on beach. Yeah. I see pros do it. Yeah, that's yeah. different. That's, that's different. what I mean. Like this, there. There was at, a time where that was like even when when I was playing beach. Yeah, there was a time where we would we would never do that. You'll like, see it, it was considered very unethical. Yeah, like, back yeah, when yeah, I yeah, today yeah. it's and different. And you would be like you would chirp the other person. Oh, especially nine by nine. People would just, people would just stop and be like, "What do you come yeah, on?" Yeah, yeah. Right? But but today it's different. Today it's yeah. different because it's eight by eight, and like sometimes you'll get a crazy rally back and forth of like you know three or four times over the net, and then all of a sudden because everyone gets bunched up closer to the net, right? If we're if we're talking like a hit block off the block, mm -hmm. and then what might ha end up happening? It'll be a hit off the block, and then boom, bumped into the back, and yeah. then that's smart. I mean, yeah. and the players move so well, like you said in the eight by eight today. Yeah, well, and a lot of the time they still get it. They still get it exactly <laughs> because they're aware of this. Yeah, right? yeah. So, but you're right. Big difference, eight by eight. And, yeah. Uh, so, and it was so it was considered cheeky. I back think then, right? Yeah, I think now it's something you need to be aware of uh, to use to utilize and also to defend against only but no, only when you're developed though so like only so, when you're yeah. developed yeah if, yeah, you're, yeah. if you're like if you've been playing beach for years but yeah. i'm talking about like you know this player here is 13 and this is indoor by the so let's let's, let's take beach out of it for a second yeah uh, even on the beach it's a bad strategy for young players who are still learning the game once you learn the game and you're playing ultra competitive and everybody's three hits then that's different that's different. Then yeah. you can do what, you know, take the gloves off, do what you need to do. Indoor, it should never be done. The only time you should ever, um, you know, put a ball over on one is if you're blocking it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's, you uh, would never put a ball over on two, of course. Setters dump, of course, that's different. But again, I would submit to you that when they're young players, uh, setters should learn how to dump once in a while, but the bulk of the focus for the coach should be on developing that three hit contact. Yeah. Cause like, again, you can win all day doing the wrong things. You could, you could win, you know, um, serving with bad form at that age, but the goal is to get them to fix the form, right? Because, yeah. um, it's harder to undo bad habits the longer we go with them in life and in yeah. volleyball. So, uh, all right, that's good. So we would say that that, so that is being criticized because it is just short term approach and you won't win at the next level if you, yeah. if you keep doing that, right? Like I, I have coached against a team that was doing a, um, they would do, I think I told, I think I mentioned this on the show before where uh, we were playing this team where we were serving them. They would pass it to uh, three. They had their setter, whoever was in three was setting, that's the front court middle. And that player would set whoever was in six, which is the back court middle. That player would just stay on the ground and pop it over our, you know, our blockers into the pot, or they would like, you know, jump up like they were going to swing and then just tip it into the middle. And they kept doing that. Or not even, they weren't even jumping. They were just like bumping it over, trying to, and they were getting some points to yeah, that because yeah. we were teaching young players the the proper T tee up, tee up, six back, and, you know, teaching them to read and, you know, okay, this team is, you know, maybe we should adapt a little bit, but we yeah. don't want to leave our system too much. I want you guys to move. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And eventually we... we uh, and eventually they, the right system would even defend against that anyway it could yes it would, it it's, would. it's very difficult because now you know now you get the players wanting to not it's do just, the system you want your six back to come yeah, up yeah. to the attack line it's you're an like, unorthodox yes. attack but you know i did have a timeout and i told them like we are 
uh, that team is playing the wrong way. Yeah, yeah. And they might beat some teams, but yeah. where are they going to be in a year from Not even a year from now, in three months from now. Where yeah. are they going to be? Nowhere. So, you know, they were able to steal a set off us doing that crappy system more. Or less. I mean, that's not what they did every play, obviously, because yeah. they shanked some balls and everything. But, but you know, our team eventually figured out that okay, we can start to cheat on them a bit. But those are those are good um, stress tests. The unorthodox team strategies against the uh, discipline. Yeah, against the the team that has a set up defensive system. It's always good to kind of come across that because it's like, yeah. oh man, because your the 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 proper defensive system will get that ball. Right. But you know what's funny about that though is that the players today will lose patience, and the parents watching lose patience. I've had even like you know other coaches like oh you're got the players that play against you... it will lose patience. No, 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 the players playing the system lose patience because like oh we're not we're not getting the we're not winning because we're right, uh, they right, keep right, hitting right. our open spots and I'm like well, listen <laughs> sounds like another symptom of it's like this is you know, like what, short focus yeah or this is our society right like yeah, society yeah. wants the short term fix rather than the long term real thing. yeah like, we want superficial. But I mean, want. that means like, I don't know, the players on the tee or even the, the middle block are like, they start to use their yes. he- brain and be like, okay, yes. like they jumped and now they're landing and they look like they're going to volley it. I'm not going to jump as a middle. I'm going to yes. back up off the net mm-hmm. or the tee defenders or be like, oh, wait, there's a tip coming. And yep. even six back is like, okay, I need to be ready. The tees are going to pinch in for the short pot ball. I need to be ready to hit one of the corners. You just become, you know, you're, it's, it's good in a way, but... That, if you're focused, yes. If you're just focused, so they're go like they were like twelve year old, thirteen year old girls. So they were just trying to remember where to yeah, be. Yeah, that's the problem. Exactly. <laughs> the problem. Their, yeah. their brain's like already so busy. It's like doing that's that sp- why it works. Yeah. It's like that spike approach without the ball, and then you put the spike the ball. Yeah, in the yeah. Drill, yeah. And the brain's like, so busy. Yeah, the brain's so busy. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why, and you know, the bigger fish or the bigger, yeah, the bigger cat, the bigger thing to teach is that positional stuff, right? Yeah. And we don't care about wins is a very tough thing to tell society at this age yeah. because we care about wins Versus. in the long term. I want you to win when it matters. Yeah. I want you to develop skills right now. And if some team comes along, like you said, it is. I said to them, I said, that's a good lesson right now. It's a good test of our discipline and our structure because we can abandon it. We can just start doing what they're doing or we can get rid of our whole system. I'll teach you guys to stand three feet off the net Yeah, right? and we'll win. Yeah. But, but are we really winning? Right? Are we really winning in that strategy? Yeah. No, we're actually losing. We're robbing ourselves of every game, and and they're also losing the opportunity. Like you said, like I want my te- teed up defenders or my six pl- six back to like, you know, get active, start reading yeah. this now. Yeah. So start up at your tee, know what's coming. It's actually a little bit of a gift, but adapt, read the player, go get the ball, and yeah. and they did, and they did, and we ended up winning it in three. But and then pound yeah. it back at them. Exactly. And, and even if you did, like like I said, even there are teams that lose to players doing the wrong things, right? On the beach, indoor, I've seen tons of teams on the beach winning by just bumping it over on one, bumping it over yeah. on one. I yeah. remember it happened to my kids that were playing as a team. And I said, listen, there is something here you can do. You can set them up so they can never bump it over mm-hmm. on one, right? Like, so if that's what they're doing, like you're doing a bump, mm-hmm. nice three hit rally and you do a nice roll shot and that kid just dives into that ball and bumps it over your heads. Well, then maybe... We should start to say deep. they were like 13. And like, yeah, we'll go deeper with the ball. So yeah. they can never do that. Yeah. And that, that strategy helps too, right? But, you know, you take the loss of points sometimes in that scenario because those t- players aren't, yeah. they're robbing themselves. It's like cheating on a test. <laughs> it's like, yeah. So, um, all right. So we would we can move on from that one, I think, right? Team yeah, is winning. So. Yeah, I think so. Meech? Yeah, Meech, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> then I'll switch to Meech's camera. Oh, Meech <laughs> isn't there. Oh, that's right. He's uh, celebrating with his other family. <laughs> Anyway, um, <laughs> oh, we don't have his camera on. I know it's not on, but it's funny because when I flashed to his camera, it it's just, just dark screen. Yeah. <laughs> sort of more bleak than, you know, it's more symbolic of a relationship with Amici right now. <laughs> uh, for people watching uh, or not listening. Um, Is it actually switching to I'm, just a. I'm switching dark. to a black screen. Yeah. That's, that's good. Uh, okay. Here's yeah. one. You can start this one off, Eric. Uh, my child uh, can't perform well in tryouts, so they play better, like you know, in school situations with friends, or you know. Uh, but when it comes to tryout season, how can I help him deal with the stress of tryouts? Well, I mean, there's a <laughs> not to not to bring it back, but there's another great thing that beach would be good for because um, it's always, especially if you're a player who's not the starter, say, and, and your indoor team. And then you get subbed in, you know, mid game or whatever, because your coach is doing the right thing, giving you opportunity. It's always stressful for that 
to go in and you're like oh and you're you're that young player and you're even even um older players it's the same same stress you're you're worried about making a mistake and your other team is even aware like oh like so and so hasn't played much and now they're in and so those are those intense moments and i kind of think that's what's going on there uh, here especially because that that's a trial situation you're kind of putting that mental stress on yourself it's a tryout you're like making into this really big thing Mm -hmm. so like with anything stressful if you do other stressful things these other new stressful scenarios aren't going to be as difficult right it's like the whole philosophy of doing a killer workout in the morning the rest of your day is just gonna be pretty easy so whether you're whether you're playing beach volleyball or you're just doing some other challenging things in life um or even if you're not doing those just being able to be in that uh, going going to that tryout feeling the stress and just staying in it you know maybe maybe the first year you you kind of yeah you make some mistakes like that's going to happen or you you know you don't play as well as you can actually play right that that will happen and you'll be a little bit embarrassed by it, but, and it'll, it'll probably be emotionally significant, but that emotion is what's going to make you remember that. Mm -hmm. Right. And then that's, what's going to make you, uh, by remembering that that's, what's going to make you try harder or whatever. And so, and if you don't put the effort in, then it's going to repeat itself. Right. And so, and and it's going to be even worse if you remove yourself from that scenario altogether. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, so, if it happens that's fine that's that's the way this works that's the way competition is that's why it's competition right so um so what was the question how do they how to better deal with it yeah how can i help him uh deal with the stress of tryouts because he's having trouble performing yeah so like i mean all things pass all things will pass yeah you know the emotion of possibly you shall not pass (laughs) no that's uh, (laughs) wrong one sorry yeah the the gandalf you know the your your son comes back from tryouts and then they're 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 like oh i didn't i didn't play as well and like they're they're they feel bad about it but like they'll feel better tomorrow and they'll feel better the day after that and if, even if they are cut the pain from that will be there but that that'll that'll pass and then and then just talk about ways to hey like what can we do to you know to improve your chances next year and then yeah that's where things like playing beach or like playing other high level sports um things like that will help mm-hmm. um i like you know i have a neat little trick what i like to do before my kids go to every try is i i take something they love and i smash it to bits <laughs> just to give them perspective <laughs> that <laughs> yeah. would work wouldn't yeah. it yeah you like this phone huh smash with a hammer and i go now go to try it and then nothing phases them genius <laughs> it's expensive already, it's expensive already though. heartbroken yeah it's expensive though but uh no uh yes i think that uh perspective teaching kids that you know doesn't matter i think parents uh energy level you know sometimes we have concern and we're like you know putting too much or right is the parent dumping their emotion on how much are we talking about this tryout on the car ride how much are we talking about yeah the coaching making the team uh some of the best things i like to tell players who are struggling in in stress stressful situations anytime is just like you know just remember here like you know planet floating through space mm, been uh, around for millions of years and uh you know mm. just remember here this is nothing not a big deal uh can and you have just, those conversations with 13 year olds yeah i think you know Why sometimes not? they freak out sometimes yeah, they freak yeah, out. Say, oh, yeah. it's terrifying. get me off get me off this yeah. rock no but you uh you can you can i did Why i mean not? i did i tell my kids that and you know but just the idea that this doesn't matter you know tons of kids playing volleyball just relax go have fun that's what it's for yeah and uh that can go a long way uh, another thing, like you said, like there's nothing wrong with them struggling. You know, perspective is uh, you as a parent understanding that that, you know, that, that there's a long life here and uh, that, you know, sport is just one more thing where they are supposed to go through the anxiety. They are supposed to feel a little bit of stress and then shake that off. I think the worst thing a parent can do is, um, you know, join them in that stress and, you know, uh, you know, you know, maybe run them to a counselor or something. I think that that, that makes a kid feel that there's something wrong with them. Yeah. Or, you know, I think that you should normalize it. Tell them that it's no, don't tell them to stop feeling stressed. Tell them to, yes, you should feel stressed. We, we all feel stressed when we're, we want something. And, but the ones who get it are the ones who understand that, um, 
there'll be other opportunities. There's more stuff down the road. Even if this doesn't go well, it doesn't mean that it's not helping you, right? That's what yeah. I always tell people. Like things that don't go well for you are very helpful for you. And then that by, it's it's funny when you have that thought, you end up doing well in the thing that you thought was going to stress you out anyway. Right. That, you know sti- I mean? that sting is good. Yes. Sting. That, sting, and, and that sting is good as long as you... It's like it's like using uh, anger to your advantage in a game. Like anger can obviously undo you, mm-hmm. but if you can kind of control it, then you can you can find energy from it, right? Yeah. Like some that extra little, yeah, you know. Uh, and the same thing, like if if you you get cut and and you don't all of a sudden have this coping mechanism or like this, you go to the counselor and you think there's something wrong, but like you internalize it now you're going to try harder in your next opportunities to practice and stuff like this. Happen- this happens to me every year. Still mm. my first beach tournament. Yeah. You know, I'm 35. I get my ass kicked and I right. come back and I'm, uh, I'm like, I'm like pissed in my head for like a few yeah. weeks, but I'm, I'm in the gym. Right. Yes. Or I'm practicing. And then, and the more you do it, like the easier it gets, like, and it, but it builds my own yeah. self, your own, my own self esteem, yeah. their own, because now I have control of the situation. I can either let it rule my life or I can do something about it. And then when you actually do something about it and then you go to the next tournament and then you do better, well, that's just reinforcing the, f- the fact that you're in control of your own life, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, and I like to tell, like, that's a great, that, that's exactly what I was going to bring up. Uh, you're in control. There's something else there too where sometimes players who have anxiety about situations or can't perform, they're too concerned with the opponent or the person next to them. And really what they need to focus on is just their results. So mm. like uh, giving your kids something to focus on sometimes before try like real practical advice. Like, so, you know, asking your, your kid, like, what, what's your, what's your goal from this tryout tonight? You know, and uh, they might say something like, well, I want to make the team. I want to, I want to, um, you know, hit really well or whatever. But if you break it down into something that's less about, you know, make sure, listen to their answers. And if they're contingent on somebody else, Uh then that's a problem. So like making the team is not in your child's control, right? They can be a great player or a solid player and not make the team. Yeah. So what you should do is like, you know, I want to work on uh, maybe, you know, being social today. I want to be vocal tonight. I want to maybe move my feet really well. Uh, I want to make sure that I stay behind the ball or whatever, you know, just whatever things that are in your son or daughter's control. Have them focus on those tiny little things. And then the night becomes a success in their mind rather than I want to be the best hitter there, right? Or I want to, have, maybe it's a, I want to have an aggressive mindset or I want to have a, you know, it's something it takes, it almost distracts the mind to focus on something smaller uh, rather than stuff that is external to them. You want it to be focused on internal stuff, not in a self-obsession way, but in a understanding that there's only one thing you can control in this whole practice tonight, this whole situation is you, right? It reminds me of like a little a little micro version of this. Maybe this yeah. was when you were coaching me, <laughs> allegedly. Um, Eric has no memory. This is such a, it. most. I think most coaches they should end up saying this. Um, this happened like when I, when we were practicing left side when we were younger, um, and this is in practice. The the same nervousness of the tryout can happen in practice when we're practicing the left side attack mm-hmm. because the left sides always typically they're so maybe it's just guys or whatever, they're so hyped up to hit the ball that when the first, you have to pass and then hit, right? <laughs> and the pass is just so shit. <laughs> and then, so my coaches would say, pass first, pass yeah. first. And so, and uh, you literally have to do that in your mind. You have to dismiss dismiss the attack completely. You don't think about it at all because, you, and you don't need to because once you pass the ball, then think pass. And not only that, um, because if you're already passing and trying to like get outside, <laughs> A, you're going to mess the pass up, yeah. <laughs> right? Well, I guess that's the main thing. A, you're going to mess the pass up. But also, if you're already... Th- there's there's a benefit to being, like we've talked about this before, to being late or thinking you're late mm. to the set because that means you are going to... You're going to... Your, your, your spike approach is going to be super explosive, right? Mm-hmm. And I think that's, that's just the synergistic thing that happens from committing first to the pass. You then pass the ball. You follow through. And now sets going up and boom you're making your approach and then you're jumping so much higher and then there's just it's such a great feeling to then a dime the ball and then crush it right Mm -hmm. so that's a that's a little mini version that that can be done in practice it's just 
remove the attack from your mindset, pass yeah. the ball, and then go. Yeah, and it's just like I think it's a metaphor. Like all of this is just such a great metaphor for life. Like if you if you are a person who's worried about external things or something that's two steps ahead, right? Yeah, like, dwelling like, on the future instead like, of the present moment. Like the thing. hit, the hit is too far ahead to worry about. Yeah. Or the you know, what you should be focused on is that first thing and then your timing has to be right, just like in life. And if you go too soon or you go too late, yeah. You know, it's gotta be just wait till you assess the situation with especially with high balls outside. Assess, wait. Yeah. And then go. That's something our society's forgetting about all the time today, right? Society mm. wants answers right away and nobody wants to wait and assess and mm. reason. We just go, 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 because uh, our attention spans can't handle it. But um but so, yeah, I think just getting a player to focus on and you so often when you get uh, you ask a kid these questions, like, what are your goals? Or you ask a team or an individual, what are your goals for this tournament, this tryout, this practice? They'll start to say things and mix in things that aren't in their control. Like, I want to win. Well, that's not in your control. You're, you're not in control of whether you win or lose here. <laughs> you're in control of your performance and the things you do. So that is something that really helps alleviate some stress because. Now they know that there's other kids out there doing their thing and whatever. But you're, if your kid learns that the tryout, how they perform is totally up to them, it's very empowering, you know, and they stop worrying about the other things. Like if a kid smashes a ball or a kid next to them competing for their spot is playing better than them, get get that out of there. Because mm. the minute they start thinking about that mm. other kid, then they're going to play worse anyway mm. and make it worse. Like we've all done that, right? Uh, I remember I used the metaphor of people, you know, sprinters don't look sideways while they're running and mm -hmm. at the start of a race, it's it's just focused on going forward, right? Because they are so focused on what they're doing. They're focused on their breath. They're focused on their stride. They're focusing on relaxing, mm -hmm. right? Sprinters, and again, another metaphor, if you are a volleyball player, you want to be breathing. You want to be relaxed. You want to mm -hmm. be f inward focused, not self-obsessed like how do, what are people thinking about me? Because mm -hmm. that's external. Mm -hmm. You can't control what people are thinking about you. So the more you get uh, into that idea that, um, you know, Understand that your child, you know, teach your children that they can, they, they should worry about themselves, have perspective on this tryout. It's not a big deal anyway. Uh, and then you might find some relaxation. And then practical things like Eric, you know, we want to talk maybe about breathing and stuff that you've worked with in the past. We're done. Like breathing in in the game. Breathing through stress. Like you're pretty good with even or even you know the idea of breath work and you know. Some of yeah. That stuff. Well, I mean. Shavasana is amazing. Like, I think we were talking about that last uh, in uh, yeah the the last Q and A episode. But Shavasana being the relaxation yeah sorry period being, of yoga at the end of a yoga session yeah yeah so okay you want me to talk about the ben yeah I mean well even in a moment like in stressful I see you visibly breathing on the court mm. you do a good, you probably take it for granted that you do it because your yoga background but mm. um, you do tend to like what about before a in the middle of a game do you ever find yourself taking a deep breath you're right I think I do I do it without really thinking about it but um, for sure like even even nowadays like with life and stuff going on like I'm we're both so busy mm -hmm. right and i can tell i can tell my own um i don't know tension uh, yeah yeah like i'm just i'm becoming too short sighted too uh too um sh shortened attention span and stuff like that right too much of an asshole you mean uh well that it'll make you irritable <laughs> just kidding just kidding it will yeah yeah of for course, sure right course. where you're Cause then you're, yeah, you're, you're, cause you're dwelling on things like these external things of what, how people perceive you or like, oh, they slighted me and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Whereas yeah, getting into breath work and stuff like that, it really does make you, uh, kind of release you, you, these things just like they, they stop dwelling on you so intensely. Mm -hmm. Right. And for sure in, in a game in between points, that's all you can do. All you can do is control the next, because this is what, this is what ends up happening. What, if you're going to continue to play the sport, you're going to you will develop this um, this little mental strategy is that all you can do, the point's over, you can, all you have is the next point. And so you may as well let it go because by holding on to it, it's just going to affect yourself. Uh, it's going to affect how you um, play that play out the next point, right? For, so this happens all the time is that I'll make a mistake, mistakes happen, I just go back. Yeah, you take a deep breath and then you just focus. I do this all the time, I just say, Eric, focus on the pass, or mm -hmm, <laughs> I don't mm -hmm. say like or that. Or next but, point, next point. Yeah, next point. So, mm -hmm. um, 
Yeah, yeah. I, th- I think you said. It, I think you mentioned it. Like the de- the the breathing is kind of good because like whenever we're in stressful situations in life or sports, we tend to notice if we stop that we're not breathing very well. So. Uh, taking a yeah. deep breath just makes your body limber and it lets the blood flow and uh, it makes you just a more, I always you know, like to compare people to plants and I always think about a plant that's rigid and uptight in a windstorm. It's going to break off and snap versus a pliant plant that's flexible, you know, getting good oxygen and uh, it's, or giving off good oxygen. Yeah, getting good carbon. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> good science there. Uh, no, but you know what I mean? The pliant plant tends to handle... Uh, adversity better than a, a rigid plant that'll break, right? Um, I think I'm turning into a guru for real. <laughs> well, that, I think that's what I was... <laughs> Must be my brown nature. For uh, I, I don't even know the reason why I brought... <laughs> good one. The, the reason why I brought up Shavasana is because I think uh, I try to do that now. Like, There's something... It's it, it's not... You don't just do that out at the end of yoga. Like, mm-hmm. You should do that at the end of your workout. Like, Yes. Because there's something about like working hard... And then just at the end of the, whether it's the workout or the yoga session, like just like lay down or or sit down and just breathe Mm. because then it's this whole, it's crazy. I don't know. It's just crazy what it does. You just feel, you just feel amazing. Yeah. And you listen to your body. Like my Ramich was mentioning in the episode of cool downs too. Like in general, it's just a little moment where you can listen and feel what's going on. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Cause, and, and I guess what, what, what is happening in that moment is, Cause if you're just going from point to point and you're just like stressed about the mistake you made five points ago or this or that, um, the whole point of the Shavasana or the reset after each point is to let go of the mental stuff because mm. otherwise you're not going to be relaxed. Right. So yeah, I guess that's dwelling. I was, I was trying to make a metaphor, but no, uh, no, but you're right. It's a clearing the mind, settling, yeah. listening, but, and dwelling. Like you, like you said that you mentioned there too, like you're, Sort of preparing you. It's also a good. They always tell you it's a good thing to prepare you to get up now, right? Like, you, it's a you don't want to just go from yoga and run outside. You want to. It's a transitionary yeah. thing, and much, volleyball has. I, I I still think volleyball is so cool that way because it has this transition every point. Yeah, and it's so cool to just. It's conditioning your brain. Next point, reset, reset. Next point, and it's just uh, you know, and the game can change so much based on. Totally. I mean, all sports are like this too, but volleyball has that neat one point long rally. I like the fact that, you know, so much in volleyball isn't in your control. Like it's not like tennis or it's not like, um, like even in, uh, in hockey and in, in basketball, football, you know, uh, one, one player or especially basketball, I think in soccer and hockey, Mm -hmm. one player can do so much Mm -hmm. on the court. They can change the game themselves. Mm -hmm. Volleyball, not never. A, a volleyball player can never, a single volleyball player can't take over too much unless they get a, a crap ton of aces or something. But, you know, in a rally situation, there, there's uh, way too much teamwork yeah. going on. So it's a very good sport to teach people that your mind um, better be focused on, you know, set those smaller goals for yourself uh, because there's so much out of your control, even on your side of the net, not just your opponent. Right? Mm-hmm. In other sports, it's like in tennis or other sports, or you know, those opponents are the ones dictating things a lot. But in um, in volleyball, you, you, your teammates dictate a lot. So it's good to train the brain and understand that that you're in you're in command. So I think that for a player who's dealing with performance anxiety or having trouble in stressful situations, part of the part of the thing too is like let's let's remember it doesn't have to get better today. Uh, the the fact that they're going and failing right now is a benefit too. And it, that's yeah. going to make them better down the road. It's going to make them better in a job interview. It's going to make them better when yeah. they're dealing with someone. It's, it's going to make, make them, them better. It's going to make them a leader on the team. Yeah. Or yeah. even if it's not a team, like sometimes I think people forget the point of sports too is maybe to make us better at life, right? We always worry about playing pro or going a long distance mm-hmm. somewhere. But, mm-hmm. you know, there's some real value in just going through tense situations in all aspects of our lives. And then that way when it pops up, you can breathe in the stressful moment. You can, yeah. like, we all feel that in life. I think people listening, everybody's had crappy days, crappy moments where they're just overworked, overstressed, or maybe something bad is going on in their life, bad relationships or something. And you catch yourself, like especially when I'm doing yoga, I catch myself. Oh, I'm like, oh, I'm not, I didn't barely breathe today. Yeah. Like, you know, you're driving everywhere, you're on a computer, and we don't stop and take that deep breath. Everybody listening, just take a deep, deep <laughs> note. It's not going to be that show, not interactive. <laughs> this is calm. Welcome to your <laughs> We are boring people, though. That's pretty good. So you can relax that way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
so yeah, so I think the idea of teaching a player about perspective, breathing, controlling what they can, uh, and and like you said, the advantage of stressful situations. Sound good? Yeah. We're happy with that? Yeah. Even, even here, I'm reflecting on uh, how, yeah, underestimated or uh, how much I don't think about how effective the breathing part oh, really yeah. is. Yeah. Once, if I'm in a good yoga mode, I catch myself all the time going, mm. like, I got to breathe right now. Mm. Like, it's pretty weird to do it. Actually, you stop and go, yeah, I didn't breathe today. And then you mm. like, just feel your shoulders fall for a little bit, you know, and. Uh, I had like every time I've ever gotten a massage, don't worry, this is clean. But every time I've ever gotten a massage, the, I'm sure, I think it, I, they say, oh, say, oh, you hold a lot. Of, you're really tense. Like, yeah. You, you don't. Uh, and I said, you sure it's not just muscle? Because it could be muscle. And then they're like, no, no, you're yeah, like holding, just, you hold a lot of stuff in, right? Just and, chest breathing, right? You're not actually dropping the diaphragm and like having full breath. Oh, you're going to say dropping my pants. I'm dropping, anyway, well. It's not that kind of, anyway. Oh. Uh, but anyway, so nobody, but I think they say that to everybody. Have you ever gotten a massage professionally? No, no, no. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, yeah I have. have they said that same line to you that you hold, oh, you're really tense? Uh, they usually just say that my shoulders are a mess. Okay, but see, either way, I think they just say that stuff because... <laughs> I think we only had a like, massage once. Oh, yeah, me too. Like twice in my like, like anniversary yeah. gift or something like that, right? But if you... I, I think they... It's not a sales pitch or am I really a freak? Like I feel like, oh, God, maybe I should come for a massage more often. Uh, I, think I, think it's, I think it's A, what you're saying, and also B, being a volleyball player. Right. Yes. Our, yeah, uh, bad our thoracic, posture. Thoracic yes. backs tend to be pretty yes. messed up. Well, she was squeezing my ass when she said this. Oh, so so, and I do. I, and you I, farted I, in her face. <laughs> I relaxed. <laughs> I, I relaxed and immediately had diarrhea, diarrhea <laughs> everywhere. Uh, but that served as the oil. No, that's disgusting. Wow. Oh, wow. That, I can't believe you heard that. Wow. I can't believe you guys listened to that. Anyway, okay, that's enough for that topic. I think we went off topic. <laughs> Did we? I don't know. Was I that? Don't yes. Know. Anyway, uh, okay. Here's one. Uh, we've been with a club for several years, but my son feels like it's time to leave and play with a different club nearby. Some friends are going there. Uh, should we give the club we're leaving notice? Should we give the club that we are leaving notice? Want me to do this one first? Give her. Okay. So I think that um, I I don't think that... So one thing, I, I understand where the parent's coming from. I think it's nice that they want to give the club notice. Um, I think that... I mean, if there's a reason why they want to leave, that's legit. If it's a coaching issue, if there's some friends there, if that's the only reason, sure. If you're leaving because you're noticing the coaching is better. First of all, I don't know if it's a great idea to leave just because friends are going there. But then again, you want your kid to be on a team where they're going to have fun. So Mm. I do understand that. But I do tell parents this, that, and I've seen this, so I'll tell you a story to preface this. Um, I know a girl who's a left-handed, right side, really good player promised a spot on a club team she's been with this club her whole time uh all the way up till the age of 16 so she's like four years and then the club team found out another taller right side play, or middle who didn't want to play middle uh wanted to play right side instead and she was going to be good on the right side and they just told her that you're going to play a lot less because we're getting this girl so then this player decided to switch to another club because what i'm getting at is the club doesn't uh, we'll we'll throw you under the bus in a heartbeat. Uh, n- most clubs, right? I, mean, I guess it depends on the relationship with the club. You might have a club where they're really nice and caring, and that's one thing. But I think if you ask this question, then you probably already don't have that relationship with the club. Otherwise, you would be staying. So I would just say to parents, especially if they're newer in the club world, that um, clubs don't have much loyalty to you. Mm. They they will they don't care. I mean. They care about retaining kids for the sake of the easiness of their job. They don't care about uh, if someone better comes along or someone new and shiny, they'll they'll put your kid on the That's probably a metaphor for life as well, right? With any organization. I'd yeah, say. yeah. <laughs> Professionally speaking, any big that's company why sports, will... That's why sports are what they are, right? Sports are big for a reason. Yeah. They tap into everything and every other aspect of our lives. So I would say that you don't need to give the club notice because I don't think the club would give you notice if they were going to cut your kid. 
<laughs> and I don't think they're going to give you notice if they were going to hire a crappy coach. <laughs> yeah, like what are are that? Hopefully, they're you're not like giving them notice as like some kind of petty way to like threaten them or something. Oh, I think no, I think this this, this sounds like, like oh some, we're going to leave. Like no, I think this sounds like someone that is trying to be nice. Like should they let they them know their spot? They want to go to play with friends, right? Yeah, right? Okay. yeah. And is their spot there? Maybe let them know their spot is open for someone else. But I think you know the club will find out, and they have a, their list of players, and they'll just work their way down to the. To the next yeah, moment. well, I mean, if tryouts are done in the way where it's a true tryout and there's none of this pre-reserved shit, mm. then it, then it, none of that matters because the next year it's reformed. But yeah, with all this pre-signing and stuff like yeah. that, like I, yeah, we talked about this in another episode. The pre-signings drive me nuts. Like it's happening everywhere. By the yeah. way, you, you post secondaries are doing it too. They're just filling up their yeah. Like, I understand their their problem and it's very competitive and you got to go find your players. But man. I guarantee you there's kids on every campus and colleges and universities that are better than some of the starters, but, they, but there was no room on the yeah. team to, for a tryout. I just don't know why coaches are doing it. Like, I understand it's a hectic world and you got to compete and get players, but the clubs are doing it too now. And it's just like, come on, make a try. Like, it'd be so refreshing. It's to, a lazy way. It's lazy and it's like safe. You know, I just want to, I just want to make sure I get my team. Like I couldn't imagine being a club coach holding a tryout. And having a better kid come through the gym, yeah, and just be like, ah, oh, yeah, we don't have any, or, or, we don't care. We just we, we got the players we know <laughs> that we like. Man, that so flies in the face of what sport is. It's like going in the safe direction. Everybody is so afraid. Like, uh, I, I understand coaches, you know, clubs are worried about losing players, but you know what? That's another thing. If you're a great club and a great coach, everybody will want to play for you anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe get your stuff, other stuff together. So you're not um, having to re-sign everybody the year before. Like, it's so crazy. Like, they'll sign them. They'll offer them contracts, like, before even looking at people who have been training for a year. And these are teenagers. These aren't 35-year-old men and women. These are these are teenagers who are growing, developing, training, doing things every summer. And you're acting like... There's no like, way those teams are competitive. <laughs> you know, it's funny. We're already seeing some teams that I think are going to get thumped. Like I'm, I'm seeing, they, they just re-sign them for safety. Yeah. And they're just going to get thumped by the teams that, that left spots just open. comfy. Yeah. But that's, you know, that's again, another nice metaphor of how life works, right? Yeah. You take the safe, easy approach and uh, where does that end up? Yeah. Especially easy, right? Easy is very seldom right. As uh, Dumbledore taught us. Yeah. Yeah. In episode... Or, oh, I just went Epis- from episode? Harry Potter to Star Wars. Movie. Movie number. I don't think they're not called no, episodes. No. I don't even know. Do you know all the Prisoner names? of Azkaban? Do you know all of the titles, Eric? Let's test Eric. Let's see. Yeah, it's the uh Go ahead. first Harry Potter. Stone. Oh Jake? no, it's the secret uh, Chamber of Secrets. Chamber of Secrets is first? Nice. You've already failed. You've already failed. Oh, it's the Philosopher's Stone. Yeah, but you can't fix it now. No, I said the Philosopher's Stone. You did, first. and I said yes, but then you corrected yourself and got it wrong. Okay, well it's Philosopher's Stone. So you're already off to a bad start. And then it's the um You sicken me. <laughs> you sicken me. Please, if you're a Harry Potter fan, don't turn us off because of Eric's ignorance. He's like the Malfoy of uh the show. Eric doesn't even know what that means. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Malfoy uh what's his last name? No, his last name is Malfoy oh, yeah. Eric. <laughs> Lucius? No, it's his dad. <laughs> oh, okay, you're restoring hope here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh Malfoy's first name is uh Hmm. Damn, what is it? Uh, listeners, shall we all yell it at once? On three. One, two, three. It's Draco. Oh, yeah. Mm. yeah. Should I ask Eric what color Draco's hair is? Yeah, it's bl- blonde. It's white. <laughs> he just, like his dad. For those of you listening, not- uh, Eric moved towards his mic and sat up straight to answer that like he was on a game show. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but he's already, he's already, he hasn't, I mean. made it, he hasn't made it to the... Anyway, let's get off this topic here. Why are you bringing up Harry Potter all the time? <laughs> How about I cut out? And he so who I should just... not be named has like no nose. Oh, very good. Yeah, yeah. No one, good. no one knows. Yeah. Uh, okay, so there's that. We can check that one off. That was good. Uh, my child is 13 years old and desperately wants to play professionally one day. What are some things she can do to help her get there? Well. Hmm. 13 and they want to play pro. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, it's pretty cool that a kid is a boy or girl to say. This is a uh, my child. Just ask me what are things that she can say. do. She can do. So yes, female. Well, I mean, one thing I'll say is like, um, I think some. But your advice would be gender neutral. This will apply to any child. 
Yes, it would. You're not gonna. Okay, so this is this could be a boy or a girl. Yeah, unless you're sexist, Eric. If you're sexist, let us know. No, no, no. I just think that um, girls tend to have a, an idea of what they want in the future a little bit sooner than guys do. All right, nice, they just nice tend save. to mature. That's what. Uh, that's what nice I was gonna say. Yeah. yeah all the mature. Save. All the it's mature boys. That's what I was gonna say. All the mature boys are turning off their Spotify's. <laughs> <laughs> right it's not a radio anymore it's a spotify right right or a youtube well i'm just trying to I, i'm just trying to imagine like damn like 13 years old and i already have like a vision for that like yes it can be a good thing no it, 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 it could be a bad thing depends yeah. on how the kid says it yeah i do get concerned sometimes when kids say it too early out loud too often yeah like it's it's not like you, they say that and all of a sudden you're like oh all right let's go let's do this like <laughs> so the, some parents would be exactly like that. well like well that's so that's what we're i'm we're here to try to give caution yes. to right yes Cause like yes. yeah because i can see that happening but it's yes, like i've seen it um because yeah it's a pretty bold statement right and like mm-hmm. and you know, obviously like well there's no definite answer here. It's not like... Yeah. And it's nice. I mean, sometimes kids want to go pro when they're young and they say that and that's great. Yeah. I mean, every probably every a lot of great athletes in history have done that. There's like, you know, Muhammad Ali was like, I'm going to be the heavyweight champ. And he was like 13. And it's like, okay. And nobody believed him probably, but, <laughs> but then he did it. Do we know if he said that? Uh, yes, he did. Oh. Yeah. I'm, I'm an Ali fan. I'm hmm. a bit of a historian. I could write a book on Ali if I wanted to. Probably. It'd be called Ali. Malfoy. That was his last name. No, Ali was his <laughs> last name, Eric. Jeez. Jeez that. Louise. Anyway. Uh, so, yeah. So, there's two types. So, I, a good question to ask your child is, why do you want to go professional? Why would you want to pr- play professionally? Because as someone who's like... Yeah, like so, what's going on? Are they watching like, a whole bunch of social media and they're seeing like the glory of it? it. Like, that's probably a big... Inf- that has mm-hmm. to be an influence, mm-hmm. right? So, that's awesome. But... Yeah, yeah. Like as the as the season goes on, if they're saying this at the start of the season or whatever, like, <laughs> and then by the end of the season, they're like, I don't want to go. Well, for it. Uh, yeah, exactly. So you're just going to be supportive and then just see where they go with it. Like, yeah. Well, a good question to ask, honestly, every young player is, um, what? Why do you want to go profession? What is it about it that you yeah. want? And if they start to say the glory. fame, glory, I want the glory, yeah, or like, I you want know, the free sneakers. Yeah, <laughs> free sneakers. Yes. <laughs> the uh, the cocaine, the prostitutes. No, just kidding. If you, wow. <laughs> if those, those are the bad answers. I thought that was soccer. No, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no offense to any soccer players out there jeez louise oh. anyway that's my new phrase on the show that'll be my catchphrase Jeez. uh oh. no the the uh because sometimes kids they want it for the wrong reasons and they don't know what it means to be a professional like so i played overseas in a time where you know i would have i wouldn't have called it a professional back mm. when i played back in the 1800s but um but by today's standards you know i would be on instagram <laughs> posting myself <laughs> in my uniforms yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, because it's not a glamorous life for ninety nine percent of volleyball players who play high level. They, they, um, it's fun. It's well, a lot of everyone, work. Everyone tries to make it glamorous. Like yes, oh, a bunch yes. Of people I know doing it. Like yeah. I often sometimes I wonder if they're doing it just so they can post stuff on Instagram. Yeah. I hope not, and I I really don't think so. Like because I think you really do have to love the sport to go and do that. And it's and it's a it's a lot of work. Like it's, it's a lot of work. It's a lot, it's a lot of, work. of work. It's, it's not a, a lot, lot of glory. sacrifice. Not a lot of glory. I know people. Yeah, yeah. I know people who not had a lot to, of money. Yes, I know who people who had to stop once their parents cut them off. Like, and I'm talking people like almost four, yes. almost forty. Yes, and because uh, they literally couldn't find like live. They didn't have enough to live off of. Yeah. Right? Uh you have to have a, a lot of people supporting you to do it, and mm-hmm. it's n- like. And what do you fall back on? Yeah, right? and there's not... Well, even the fallback, I mean, it's kind of nice to go into something without a fallback plan sometimes because uh, it makes you work harder. Cause that's true, actually. Because when you yeah. create that fallback plan, you're, and that's then another way of if, saying you're not 100% all in, right? Right, right. Because if you have a fallback plan, you're really not going to try that hard down that avenue. Yeah, especially if it's one of those ones that people... For some reason, we have these categories of things, right? Like actors, like anything arts, creative, or sports are like crazy when people say they want to do it professionally. But yeah. Well let's suppose you have a kid who's who wants has the right work ethic. They love doing the hard work. They love suffering. They don't mind losing. Uh, these are all by the way, so here's the qualities. They I think. love suffering. Well yeah, a, a young <laughs> a young player I think that has the qualities and is legit um 
I, I have seen young players that are definitely like I, I knew them at young ages and they're, they're probably going to be on a national team already mm-hmm. like on, on beach and I saw them at a young age and they were crying after a loss at like age 12 okay on the beach and at the Wait, time and you're saying they're going to be on well the well, team? well see so so this is what I'm saying to you so it's hard to look at something on the outside and know because at the time I thought oh that kid's not gonna last like you know no mental toughness right at all. but what if the kid was crying because they were so passion you know what i mean oh, like what I if see. the kid was like man i really wanted to win and, and like not crying out of like uh i'm a loser crying out of just you know that desperation yeah. to want to be the best and or, trying yeah and then but and then i know that player as that play, it's a beach player and she's aged and she's traveled you know to the statement i was telling you about this to play full time all like so they play the beach season where we are then they move into the south and they go play like they get that support network and they're dominating and now like super mental tough super mental strong done enough reps that the to go back to our earlier point she's done enough reps that you know one shank doesn't matter to her mm, tryouts mm. don't matter to her mm. because she's been doing it so much and been placed in those stressful situations so much so i mean there's the healthy passion cry and then there's the oh no i'll never make it cry right which, which is what yeah that's what you that's what i was thinking too yes, i had the right. same thought and i was like oh my god look at that kid crying and then years later i see that kid and i'm like okay so that was like i'm gonna do whatever it takes to win well, um which is that crazy mindset that you need to have too to be at that level so right so that, that, that's what i was gonna ask you is like if if uh you know if we see a kid uh and, and we we think oh man like they they're they may go far in the sport what is it what is the quality that's giving you that that it, and i think you just answered it's the temperament yeah there's right? a few things that i look for in- like it, it, it's obviously it's talent it's like an innate degree of talent because you know we, we talk about you know genetics and like people having skill but then there's like those the the pro athletes that we all see in the NHL and the NBA and all stuff, they are, they are of that cohort of, of talented players, but then they are the upper echelon of it. Right. So it's like, but some of it's weird though. Cause some of them aren't the upper echelon in these teen years. No, no, that's, that's just the it. Weird you thing. No, exactly. Yeah. Like you may, and could, some of them may be visible at that age, but yeah. m- the majority of them will not be visible in that age. Right. And, so and it's kind of rare. It's rare to else, see. You know what's so tricky about it too, is that, it might not the genetic thing or that innate thing that you were talking about. It might not even be their physical ability. It no. might be their genetic ability to not quit. Oh, you I know, see. Or yeah. they could be a late bloomer. Well, genetic, that's what right? I mean. I think the core of it. It's hard. It's got to really be the hard. temperament. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. But well, again, we're talking about a small per- portion of our of an already small portion. Yes. Right? Yes. So, yeah. Because yeah. yeah, the majority of people who do play pro, like you don't, they're not really. At, at 13, people aren't saying, oh, they're going to go pro. Like No. And even at 15, it's some it's sometimes like, you know, about 17, 18, where you yeah. see it. And then, yeah. and then the only reason that that still happened, because there are kids that have quit volleyball at age 17, 18. But if they kept playing into their 20s, they might have become dynamite. Yeah. And that's, that's true. I'm seeing it right now a little bit with a player. Uh, who's just about she's just about eighteen and just f- f- a switch no it's well a switch has flicked uh, a switch has flicked a yes switch a sw- has, yeah that's right, right? yeah a switch has <laughs> it just flicked. sounds weird it did just sound like I said the flick has switched flicked switch a switch, a switch. <laughs> <laughs> um anyway harry potter um so the that's a magic spell isn't that a yeah, uh, uh, wingardium leviosa yeah uh no but uh switch has flicked and this kid but I, if this kid didn't play this year which they could have because they were going switch. into first year so. <laughs> sorry i'm still on the switch sorry uh, yes um <laughs> uh, so this player if they didn't play this year they wouldn't have discovered this what's happening you know, because they were going into first year post secondary, didn't make the team, but were able to still play club. You have to play club, and if they didn't play, then they never would have had this revelation that we're all seeing. Right. Uh, so you know, again, we go mm-hmm. back to this again and again. Volleyball is a late blooming sport. You got to have some physical strength. It's almost like I, I compare it almost to pitchers in baseball, mm-hmm. where they rarely come into their own until their mid twenties, and I think a lot of volleyball players are that way too. That's when you get strong. That's when you get uh, more weight behind the ball. I get more, you get more intelligent cord- to your frontal yeah. lobe is there. The coordination, all yeah. kinds of if you st- dial in. Yeah. But the problem is most people quit before they get to the stage where their strength and their mind yeah. and their body catches up. So, I mean, so for, for young players, what I would say, if you have a young child who who is interested in playing pro and has some of the good qualities of, 
you know, working hard, dedication, can shake things off, uh, is willing to do extra things. That's, that's one of them. Uh, doing, yeah. doing, if the kid can do extra things, uh, and is willing to do it, <clears throat> excuse me, without, um, you know, uh, without you dragging them. I see a lot of parents dragging their kids to things and that's the sign that you yeah. know, maybe you should yeah. temper that expectation because they don't yeah. have it because it has to be an insane amount of passion. Right, an insane, yeah. almost, almost. They, like they you have, have to be an unbalanced, an imbalanced person in life, yeah. not not mentally, but <laughs> you have to see that they have a comprehension of what hard work is, and sacrifice. Yeah, and persistence, right, and like staying at it, and yeah, like my my, you know, if I have, you know, if I see kids that you know they they say I've heard kids talk about this a lot, obviously in what we do, and. Um, yeah, but then they'll be out partying with friends every weekend, and you know, the, yeah. if the actions don't match up with the be- with the desire, that's you know something that people sometimes don't see in themselves. But some advice, so yeah, get them into extra things. I think that um, you know, weight training uh, in, in a smart way. Uh, there's the old weight training that's not very smart. And again, we're coming out with a lot of resources for parents that free stuff and very inexpensive stuff. Uh, we're coming out with that soon. Um, some of those extra things can really go a long way for injury prevention because that is the risk too. Whenever a parent hears the pro word or a player thinks a pro, they start doing stuff sometimes that's dangerous and painful yeah. and, and then the kid's shoulders burnt out of their knees, toast by the time they're yeah, 16 yeah, yeah. You know, from overuse. Um, so something, yeah, get them in those extra things, uh, playing as much as possible. I th- I still think beach has to be a part of their development somewhere. I think it's what made players like Karch Kirai, the guy we talk about all the time, is like yeah. the god of volleyball. Uh, he was that way because of his, uh, his volleyball experience. So, or sorry, beach volleyball, uh, connections too. Um, yeah. And I think, I think encouraging them, maybe telling them sometimes that another risk when, when kids talk about playing pro at a young age is that every point becomes, every failure becomes magnified. Because they, if they start to, uh, I always like to tell people, like, even if my kids talk about, you know, they want to do something down the road in volleyball, I will say, well, you know, all you have in front of you really is tomorrow or right now. Like, that's all you really have. Mm-hmm. So, like, what are you doing now? What are you doing tomorrow? What's in front of you? Work on that. Because if you worry about what's, you know, 15 mm-hmm. years down the road or five years down the road or 10 years down the road, it's nice to have a goal quietly in your head, but... If you if you work if you are thinking about that every failure becomes like this giant wall in your path, versus a small an important step on the way, you know I think too many people see obstacles as walls rather than steps. Uh, so yeah, that's my I would just I, I would be worried about you know make sure your kid has good good. Uh, there's that word like we talked about with the triads, the perspective, right? Yeah. I mean, that, that's probably a good way to check because if, you know, they say pro one day and then all of a sudden, if they're just, they're letting these future obstacles, they would just crush them the next day. You know what I mean? That's how you can tell if this intention has some genuine, um, yeah. Resilience. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. That's an important word, I think. Um, yeah. So I think just getting them into the extra things, a lot of touches, I would also say caution parents, like, you know, sometimes when parents start to say, what are the things um, we can do to help her get there or she can do to help her get there? I think just playing, you know, and, and also, honestly, keeping it a little light. I think doing some other things. If this player is only 13. Yeah, don't take the yourself temptation. too seriously. I think there's another don't question. Take... Yeah, this is the next. Uh, yeah, actually it ties in with our next question oh, about specializing. Well, there's oh. a segue. So maybe we can answer that one in connection with this. And sure. the next question is about another young player that, who wants to play other sports and the parents worried about injuries. Is it a good idea to play other sports or should we specialize in this player is only 14? So, or sorry, this player is also 13. They're um, worried, worried about injuries? They're worried like if they're... other sports? Yeah, like if they're... Should their child specialize basically at age 13? Well, don't play rugby. I'd <laughs> say that. <laughs> yeah. Cause... Oh, actually, that's funny. That's funny you mentioned that because we literally have a player who's on a the 18 year old team and uh her last rugby game of her life was like uh just uh this season at the start and she uh tore her acl what and is out for the whole year of volleyball and she was so distraught she came to this tournament just sat there in crutches because she was ready to dedicate her life to volleyball she's a pretty good hitter too pretty good left she's a lefty uh right side and she oh yeah and she's you now she's got what? acl surgery I coming mean... up and so yeah, you, it's funny you mentioned rugby. I, was, I, I mean, I said that for the reasons that your fingers are going to get all messed up. Right. But like an ACL tear can happen in, in any sport. But yeah, I mean, rug, rugby's obviously it's just injuries are going to happen, yeah. right? But that sucks, man. Mm-hmm. Well, there's a but this player's a little young, 
Um, and this came up in our last Q&A about multi-sport athletes. Like, I, I started out as a soccer player. So, yeah, what you, was you it? They, they're, they're, what is it, the question? It's like, do so, they want to play other sports? So in, can, yeah, we were, so we sort of were going into this uh, about the professional athlete, the kid that wants to be a pro. We said that other things they can do to help her get there. I was gonna, We were going to talk right. about playing different sports. Yeah. Because uh, that gives perspective and teaches different muscles to go. Yeah, yeah. I personally think that so soccer was like one of the reasons I think I became – pretty strong at beach because reading so i was a midfielder yeah. I was a center midfielder in soccer for a lot of years on a rep team when i was young and i, I was a center midfielder i was too <laughs> i i probably was before you were yeah probably yeah, yeah. i think you weren't uh born when i was playing yeah but i was i was center midfield before you were oh really? for sure oh, yeah that's it was fact checked i got i got scouted at a flea market true story really yeah uh, so I was playing. Uh, well, should I go into the story? No, but anyway. So soccer <laughs> was. So soccer because I was just playing soccer in this other rep team. You're I was kicking, like, hey, aren't you kicking that stuff team? to the vendors? Aren't Here you? Go. Aren't you playing for that other? Yeah, I was kicking stuff. To the and they're like, oh my god. Yeah, yeah that guy's really fast. Um, no, so the uh, soccer I think is great because I think it helps you read because they you know they tell you to read the body, not the yeah. ball sometimes, right? And you're watching. You have to anticipate a pass by seeing where they open up to. Yeah. So that's I think that's something I took for granted in volleyball playing and beach volleyball. It was like so much. There's easier. a lot of. Oh, wow, there's a lot, there's a lot of cells in soccer as well, like fake and then yeah, kind of this way yeah. And, so you're constantly reading, and I think that I've heard that that's what a lot of people say. So soccer helps in volleyball in that way, and then you got endurance, different muscles are firing. So that yeah. it's injury prevention stuff. So I, I we always tell young players, you know, if you want to specialize around 15, 15, 16, maybe. Um, yeah, I think maybe even late, I don't know, maybe sixteen. Maybe soccer. Soccer is great for endurance. It's great for your ankles. Mm -hmm. um, I almost think of beach volleyball as a different sport. Yeah, we right? really should. We I really do. Should. I think of it as a totally different sport. Yeah, you know, I think the shoulder burnout thing can happen. Maybe that's part of the reason why those coaches discourage against it is because they're like, it's a yeah. totally different sport. Yeah. Like, but um, hockey makes. You get jacked legs, yes. but there's a sport that can, especially it happened to me while growing, I think like, because it's, you know, you're leaning over one side, right. my back kind of got messed up and stuff. Yeah. That would be awful. Yeah. In the back. If I could, I would have just done speed skating, but then as a kid, I wouldn't have been interested in it. But in hindsight, as an adult, speed skating would have been sweet because your legs would just get massive, but maybe that wouldn't be too good because you don't want. And you get to wear those leather full body suits, right? Those are leather, right? They're definitely not leather. <laughs> Mine would be. They go super fast. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, yeah, other sports are for sure really good. And then, what you say, specialize around 15, 16? Yeah, I would say, yeah. yeah like, I, I, think, so like I think once you hit about 16, it's time to pick a sport. Not yeah. only be, I, also because of the demands of it. Like, it's almost unre impossible. Like, I would, I, mental health of kids. Like, I see some kids trying to play two different rep sports, and I'm like, that's too hard. That's yeah. awful. At that that's, age, where the practice times get intense. Yeah, and, right. Because I would still say, still play other stuff. Like, if you're into playing, fun. yeah, play tennis with your friends and stuff, but it's not, it's not your competitive sport. It's just for fun or whatever. Yeah, that's a good point. Whatever, right? Good point. Like, yeah. Formality versus informal. Yeah. Yeah. Like my kid, like, is recently fun. Got, yeah. My kid's getting into badminton a lot recently. And, uh, oh, badminton and squash are sweet. Badminton is great and for volleyball, too, right? Yeah. Like, she found she was pretty natural. At, yeah. Like, yeah. you know, as from defending, like the reaching down and even the overhead smashing. She's yeah. just naturally better at it because of volleyball. Yeah. And so they feed each other nicely. And, uh, yeah, so, badminton would be really good. Yeah. Plus, we're brown. So, court speed. Yeah. Is that racist today? Yeah. <laughs> We are brown though, it's true. Uh -huh. I think it's more of a it's a healthy glow. It's a it's a tan. <laughs> it's a, I, I have a tanning bed in my bedroom. <laughs> uh I don't know if you've ever heard of a guy named Donald Trump, but I, I tan like that. <laughs> uh okay, so we would recommend that the athletes you should let them play different sports at age thirteen. Yeah, for yeah, sure. If they yeah. want to, and it, especially if their friends are doing it, like I think the real danger that people are doing is specializing too soon now, right? That's the real danger, especially you get repetitive yeah, stress injuries. Yeah, or getting injuries. too competitive too soon, like people getting the well, I don't know, is that a bad, good or bad thing? Like, you know, kids, uh, I remember I have a friend who two daughters in hockey and they're both mm, playing oh like triple A. Well, I guess for girls, it's it's double A, I think. But it just, either way, it's the highest end yeah. competitiveness and like that's got to be pretty intense but yeah but also i mean I, but I think i think that's their sport though i don't think they're doing I, mean, I think they're doing like soccer in the summer or something but it's probably a good thing i mean 
she yeah. she was a pretty competitive person uh, herself. Um, yeah, she definitely was very competitive. So I can see how that um, maybe her kids just passively pick that up from her. Mm-hmm. Uh, she's a pretty like high achiever type thing. But um, I don't know. and genetics. You know, my, mindset like once you see kids and yeah. parents, man, it's I think apple in the tree, right? They actually they actually tried out for volleyball, and I think, um, but because they made hockey, and the hockey has gotten more attention, that they just went for that instead. So, yeah, and she and she actually realized again, being a competitive player when she's younger, she realized they can't do both. That's, yeah, yeah. How old are the kids? They're young. They're like they're like nine and ten type thing. Uh, yeah, and see that's where the world is getting crazy. Where like the the hockey coaches are demanding that much time, you know, because yeah, and they don't understand time, that that's money. not how you get an excellence program. You know, you don't get an excellence program by, you know, I mean, you you could argue that you know we stole this sort of model of development sort of was stolen from like Eastern Europe and China back in the day. Uh, when they were succeeding at kicking ass at sports. Are talking about communism? I'm talking about, yeah, communist, Soviet <laughs> Union, yeah, oh. and uh, China. No, yeah, well, just just those, no, but Eastern Europe, too, were, yeah. you know, the steroid era where all of these Eastern European athletes were dominating the Olympics and the Americans. Well, I think these kids were in school and they were basically specializing in the sport while in school. Yeah, they were living there and they, they were also, like, massive. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't yeah. know if you watched that documentary on... Uh, you know, Caitlyn Jenner, Bruce Jenner uh, on Netflix. But I forgot as a child, even how big Bruce Jenner was huh. when he was competing. Uh, he was deaf. I mean, I don't want to say it. Yeah. Uh, luckily, nobody listens to this. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> on he, like, but he was trying to chase down sort of a Russian guy that he looked up to in his first Olympics. So Bruce Jenner did not do well in his first Olympics. He was only 22. His second Olympics was in uh, in uh, Montreal in 76. Mm. That's the one where he dominated, set the world record and everything. And he was chasing down a Russian guy who wasn't massive, but he was definitely bigger than the decathletes today. Yeah. Like yeah. muscular ones, yeah, right? Yeah, decathletes are... Today they're... they're small, f- smaller, Smaller, sli- yeah, muscular, but not slightly. crazy. Yeah. And, you know, you could argue that, you know, there's a theory that all athletes are doing something that's hiding it better. But, but back then, yeah. it was pretty obvious by looking at those guys that they were giant. Yeah. And... Um, so I didn't remember that in my memory, but looking back at it now, you're like, of course they were doing stuff. So like the, just going back to the idea yeah. that like, so when they were putting, when, when, when other countries that we are copying were putting kids in intense sports at really young ages, that was in the era when they were just giving them whatever to recover, right? Right. Injuries were getting right. over faster. I mean, steroid use, that's the number one thing for steroid use. That's why it's so prevalent in yeah, the NFL recovery. because it's recovery time, yeah. right? And so that's the thing missing. And you know? now, so we're still doing this. We're getting kids in these competitive and, and, and like you said too they were in schools mm. probably with great coaches who knew what they were talking about we're putting them out in hockey and soccer and yeah. football teams and local communities with crazy wannabe pros right and just like you said that organization will dump you as soon as your kid's injured they go you know they're yep. like all right well sorry like they're burning through them yeah right? they're burning through it's these like, kids well, our program is going to move forward Yes. Without you, basically. Yes. So yeah. So I, I think it's good to play. I, th- I like the fact that you mentioned playing light. Uh, you know, letting kids play sports, uh, different sports for skill development, muscle training. You actually you're working stabilizer muscles. You're probably yeah. less likely to get injured if it's the right sport. Learning how to win at a different sport, different strategies, different implementation. Yeah. And I, it was mental probably, break. Yeah. Mental break too. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And maybe, you know, especially in the case of like tennis or an individual sport or badminton and stuff like that, like they're individual, right? Like that's another. That's what we find. Like we're playing tennis a lot yeah. these days before my Achilles injury. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's awesome. I freaking, it's really, I freaking it's such it. a different, it's yeah. such a different thing, right? Especially with uh, the first serve, second serve thing. I love, that's, uh, that's a fun little yeah. tough, tough strategy. Thing to get another yeah. strategy, right? Do I go for them both? Yeah. Or do I go for the first one only, try right. to slow down the second one? But then you can't because Zuby's so good at returning. <laughs> <laughs> You've got a pretty decent slice. But then the last time we played, I think it beat you 6 nothing, right? So Yeah, but I was fat then. Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> Um, but see, I'm trying to do stuff with the ball, Eric. I'm I'm missing because I'm working on you know different uh, that's things. Funny, right? I was going to say that because in rallies, it's a fine line of aggression or just being. Well, uh, there is a thing, <laughs> and I'm like, or just get it over. I'm like, yes, yeah. because ah. Eric is what I think they call it a pusher in tennis, right? A pusher. A pusher. I think is someone who just yeah, sends the ball. Over. I was doing that and so, so much. It, it, it's hard. Like so, I play tennis. I I play tennis with another guy who hits the ball really hard at me, and oh. I do well against him. So when Eric sends me these slow ball, I'm waiting forever. Like I'm five. <laughs> my nails waiting for it and i mess up because yeah. it's but it's anyway. true but because i try to do too much with the ball but 
I think Eric would acknowledge. But it. really, I'm a pretty devastating force. <laughs> Eric, can we at least acknowledge for the listeners uh, that you know I'm a devastating force on the tennis court? Yeah, every time you step, the earth <laughs> court shakes. I'm yeah. not really fat. If, right? he, if people are listening <laughs> to this, uh, the people aren't watching. I'm not. I'm not really fat. It's a joke. Okay, I'm oh. fat with a pH. No, there's nothing wrong with being fat, by the uh-huh. way, Eric. Uh huh. I never said body that. shaming me here. No, it's just it's muscle. It's just. Hard. Working my stabilizer <laughs> muscles every time the court's like, burr, burr. <laughs> oh jeez. Okay, all it's right. Like a that's vibration it. plate. That's it. That's it. Now that's all I needed. Filed away. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but so your your child definitely I think should play different <laughs> sports at age thirteen. We can agree. Yeah. And um, ping pong. Ping pong. What about what about movement? Wii bowling? Wii bowling. Do people still there's play new, Wii? There's a new thing. I guess coming. I guess you can just do Have you seen it? The Oculus new, bowling. Yeah, there's some new video game thing and they show these people in their living room on the commercial, but it's not good. Oh. All I think of is someone breaking a lamp when I when I see those things. Yeah. <laughs> but um, it's just a lamp, all things pass. You know, yeah, all things pass, yeah. Except electrocution. <laughs> All right, uh, so that's good. So yeah, we encourage multi-sport here, and, and that's by the way. There's lots of studies on this that every great high athlete was playing other sports for very long times in their lives. So multi-sport athlete is the way to go for as long as possible. It comes a time to specialize, maybe about sixteen, maybe about seventeen. But yeah. if you do specialize before that, ninety-nine percent chance your kid's going to get injured and burnt out mentally. Ninety-nine well. percent chance. Well, I think hundred percent chance. Well, I mean, everyone's going to get injured. No, no, but I mean like repetitive mean, stress injuries. Yeah. Like so. The one, the kind of injury that will take them out of the sport. Yeah, for, yeah. Yeah. And also more importantly, I think mental burnout. 100%. Yeah, I've seen yeah. it. I've called it with kids. Like, I hate seeing kids with mental burnout. I mean, they're a kid. They should be like having fun, man. Like that's the I whole. Know. Well, that's where, sorry, that's another question. No. Yes, it Are is. Are we just yeah um, segueing and seg- segue? Yeah. The, the, well, the question was why about do they call it a segue? You know the the riding thing. Yeah. Because it um, gets you from place. Is this what it's called? Place. Oh, moves you. No, I think it was a mis- I think I, I think I read. A, I saw a documentary about that. You watched the documentary. I watched a documentary about the Segway Inventor. You, no, no. Do you, you know you were gonna buy one and you were looking at a whole bunch of different reviews on which one to get? Is that what you did? No, I'm on my, the nicest. Well, segways. according to you, I'm turning into a Segway. Mm. just rolling everywhere see what i did there that's a segue no Uh, it's not but anyway no the idea was um do you know the guy who invented the segue uh it's the same guy who invented those cool coke machines no not dyson the sous vide no you know the cool coke machines at at movie theaters where you can like um touch the screen and like make all different types of coke you know like at i don't know if you ever go to landmark cinemas you've never seen those coke machines at the movie maybe games? i just never so it's like all touch screen and like if you hit coke then you get vanilla coke raspberry coke vanilla coke and then you can touch that and it mixes the right flavor of coke and just like endless possibilities of drink combinations how is that okay yeah it's very advanced but he did it how is that advanced it's just well because the machine inside like see eric you're looking at the outside but like if there's like no, it's just little valves if there's like 30 different types of cokes Right in there, and there's like all these flavors so in a can small mix, space. Like, normal Coke with vanilla Coke. Yeah, so there's vanilla, there's raspberry, there's cherry, way more flavors than you see at a convenience store. And then there's also Sprite with the same variations. And then there's also whatever tons of root beer and all that stuff. It's so it's, it's, cool. it's yeah, it's pretty endless selection in the small space. Anyway, he invented. I don't know why we're talking about this, but he invented. <laughs> But it's our show, so they can yeah, fast forward. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, but people are dying to know this story. Uh-huh. Anyway, so he was going broke with the Segway because nobody was buying into the Segway. You know those things that roll around. Sometimes you see cops on them, right? And so he, and, cops. so he made a deal with I think it was was it Landmark or with Coca Cola. He sold them this technology or something just to fund the Segway. I <laughs> wow. think that I'm pretty sure that's the story. I'm pretty sure that's accurate. Anyway, that's whatever. Okay. Anyway, very proud of that. Anyway, so. Uh, what was we're back it? From, we're back from you fast forwarding. So yes, next yeah. question. <laughs> uh, we were going. We were talking about uh, injuries, and then someone said, uh, "Oh, burnout for kids." Well, yeah, and just saying, like a uh, kid being burnt out, it just sucks to see that because, like, I mean, right? Challenges and learning is important. Kids are gonna. They're always gonna be. You know, just going to school is a challenge, right? And so. It just sucks to see when a kid is like burnt out, truly burnt out from a sport because it's like, just 
I don't know. There's almost like no reason for it, especially when playing other sports is so so good for them, and and, and playing a sport is fun, mm-hmm. you know. And then it has its competitive side and it has its fun fun side. I found the question. Do you want me to say the actual question? Yes, <laughs> that was good stalling, Eric. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, should I? So the question was: Should I curb my daughters to play? That was that's what I was going to get. Should I curb my daughter's desire to play, or at least reduce the amount of things she does to avoid burnout? Because you know you do have those kids that will stop, will not want to stop playing, and will not want to stop training. And sometimes a parent does have to rein it in. I would say don't rein it in with like, you know, don't rein in their passion. But because kids will want to go do whatever, right? Well, right. Like for way too much, right? <coughs> a lot of adults do that too. But what I would say is, you can have teach them that. Um, Part, loving if you love a sport or getting back to that pro player question too it's the same thing if you have that much passion for it teach them that it's bigger than just playing and doing all these training sessions right there's a lot more to this puzzle of success and passion than just playing non-stop training non-stop there's other things there's mental training there's getting away from it by the way yeah. right? teaching Restraint. a play, yeah teaching a player to unplug from the game back yeah. away from the game do something different playing that other sport like we talked about for fun not for competitive reasons that is teaching your child really what it takes to be a pro or mm. really what it means to um understand uh you know that you have to uh temper passions a bit it's risky to go all in mm. what was that great there's a great quote um that came up in a, again going back to muhammad ali a documentary uh about muhammad ali where um uh, George Plimpton. If you don't know who George Plimpton is, look him up. He's a fascinating person. He's a journalist who also was a professional athlete in five or six different sports. He was like the Tim Ferriss before Tim Ferriss. By the way, Tim Ferriss models himself after this guy. Hmm. Uh, and he said in this documentary, he became a great sports writer. He said, people think that it's um, that uh, you know we kill what we love, but it's the other way around. What we love will can destroy us. Hmm. Because if we go too much into it without mm. learning about balance and restraint and not balance, but pulling back at t- from time to time, then the burnout is inevitable and it will destroy you. And he was talking about Ali in that case who never wanted to stop boxing, right? And look what happens to, you know, later in life. You get issues and all boxers and all, a lot of people who do too much of anything they love, they get uh, yeah. hurt by that. Path. That's what, yeah. kills. I mean, look at <laughs> maybe I'm living proof too. I'm 47, just about 48. And you know, my Achilles tendon just popped the other day. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty, pretty uh, soon. I'm just going to have to be playing cyber, cyber volleyball. <laughs> <laughs> well, and we talked about this, I don't know when, but like even, you know, I've done this many times when we haven't worked out in like a month or so. And all of a sudden we get into the gym and then we just go way too hard Hmm. And then we've got doms for like five or six days or something. And we were talking about those trainers who train their athletes to be able to train the next day, right? Mm. To show some restraint and not do the super heavy sets, but to do the light sparring and stuff like that, or the, the lighter, lighter work so they can do it the next day and the next day and the next day. Mm. Um, and I mentioned, do you remember I said that maybe, isn't it neat to think of that as part of the training? Cause yes. like, so right. part of the training is, is to train restraint. your mind to not go hard. Cause sometimes you're in the gym and you want to do more, you want yeah. to, you know, whether it's volleyball or anything, I want to keep going. I want to yeah. train. I want to lift more, lift more, lift more. But what if you start to consider the tempering your desire to go gangbusters? That is also part of the training, and you not can, to overdo it. Right. And you can, you can, I suppose you can not just call it restraint, but you could also call it the, the recharge cycle or mm. the restoration. Yes. Like it's not like you just stop or you, cause you can do other things like working on your mobility or the breath work and stuff. Um, that kind of, that'll that'll help you it's this yeah it's active so if Mm -hmm. you're still overly anxious to to do something you know meditating or yoga it might seem like you're not doing much like you're just holding a static stretch but you're actually actively keeping your focus on that right but isn't it good though don't you think to even like you know one of the things we all say we need to get away from it for a bit like you know anything you're doing really well like you need to unplug unwind uh you know go watch a movie you know it doesn't mean you have to eat like an idiot but sometimes you know even the 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 idea of a cheat day when you're eating you know is not and another great yeah another great thing uh with volleyball beach and indoor that 
how many times that happened you almost get burnt mm-hmm. out of indoor by the end and then you're Every excited year. to go and play beach and <laughs> yeah. then by the end of beach you're like all right i'm kind of ready to go bounce some balls in indoor and then wow i love how you brought that full circle eric you brought it back i to know the, the importance we of are beach. just beach seg- is segwaying the... <laughs> everywhere right that now. coca-cola machine funded seg- segue <laughs> that is not, no no that yeah, beach is a great you know, you're right every year we say you know at the end of indoor season i'm kind of done yeah. I'm ready for beach. Especially where, yeah. Bring on the beach. And then by the end of the beach, you're like, let's go indoor. It's a great mental thing. That's that's another thing. Another reason to keep playing to do beach. It gives you that keep, break. It feels like a different sport. In the sport and, it does. Yeah. But uh, another thing, like this kid is so, uh, in this question in particular, if they're so passionate, like, do you think um, they're only, they're passionate, but only because of that sport? Because it, I think if, if I saw a kid that's, that's, that's that passionate about that sport, like they could have that much, um, I, I'm just overusing the word passion for other things in life. You know, they could mm-hmm. be a very addictive type ad- personality. <laughs> well, not, I, I wasn't going to say addictive, but just enthusiastic, yes, right? Yes. Or someone. Well, they're... my daughter's like that. My, my, you know, my daughter's like that. Yeah. She's like, so lo- it's not just involved. She's passionate about a lot of things. Yeah. Very overly that's what excited. I mean. like, yes, it, yes. So that, that can be an advantage. That, uh, I mean, it's just a trait, or a, a trait with its pros and cons to it, right? But it, if it's, you know, guided in the in the right way they can really they can do well and, and they can apply it elsewhere yeah that's right? true yep yep so yeah it's nice to see yeah um, it is nice to see and but it is good yeah, i think parents like i do think that kids sometimes remember that we have to understand too psychologically speaking and uh, again i will say this every episode i think but i taught psych for a lot of years too we know that the frontal lobe of the brain is not developed in yeah. young people and they will make bad choices to the point of excess so you know, I have seen kids that do a lot, and it is a parent's job to kind of rein them in, gear it, un- teach them the bigger picture of what what this means, and you know, maybe you got to go and do some other things once in a while, just to make sure that you don't get. Um, I, I think parents have to be very careful with burnout these days. I think, I think, okay. that's, I think that's the one it, thing I'm seeing a lot of kids think that they want to do something all the time, but they don't understand, you know, uh, I think that's like whether it's eating chocolate cake or anything we love, right? Like you just have to be careful. It's a very tricky line of, you know, when will my 13 year old kid or 12 year old kid, um, they don't know what's good for them. Maybe sometimes, right? Sometimes a parent has to play that role where, you know, and, and if, if your kid's that unable to switch off and do something else for like a day, (laughs) that's that's... a little problematic Mm. (laughs) Or, or it will be down the road. Um, is there any situation where the opposite may be true where they're just so again like i, I i'm picturing it as a form of enthusiasm but if it's yeah, addiction no, no. for sure but like oh no yeah i i'm like, picturing it as enthusiasm too but yeah i know what you're saying yeah is ahead. it is it possible that it's the parent is trying to impose their own restrictions on like on the kid instead of kind of like a subconscious yeah well, like, i mean i guess it is yeah i think I think just based on what I see, though, in like, the volleyball world, I think this question is coming from a place of... I think so, too. I think yeah, so too. I know what you're saying, though. There are, But parents. if it's like a lazy parent or something, or I don't know, not to like <laughs> knock on the parent, but no, like, no, 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 like, no, but what I, if... I've, I know parents who you didn't know? get their kids into sports because it meant more... Yeah. They had to drive for... Yeah, I hate to see that But, stuff, I mean, yeah. that's also a real, like, a, like, time and money, like, it's... Yes. Uh, well, that's why, I mean, there's another great segue. That's why we're doing this, right? Stop it. Putting up... <laughs> <laughs> it's just a Ferris wheel on here. No, no, no. It's it's good because we are uh we're doing this to make we're putting up the videos and uh making skill videos and doing these discussions because we want more kids to have free access to good coaching mindset, good right, coaching right. drills. That's right. that's literally why we're doing it, right? And uh so you know, um that's yeah, that's a that huge problem. Yeah, like, when you said money, that's true. I, I, I do understand the parent that can't put their kids yeah. in sports or Yeah, yeah. And maybe, then you're gonna feel guilty, right? And like yeah, and that's gonna affect the parents' uh, mental health and then that'll just passively yeah. goes into the kid, right? Yeah, nothing worse than that. By the way, parents, if you are struggling with like, you know, f- you know, um you know, the financial side of club volleyball or any sport, don't forget like Reach out to the club and let them know. We talked about this in an earlier episode yeah. about the high cup cl- uh, club uh, fees. That um, you know, clubs do have money set aside for these things, and you just have to sadly like it's, it's a pride issue for sure. But just it, let them yeah. know that you hit a rough spot, especially coming out of the pandemic. I think a lot of people are, and they're not talking about it. Yeah, or they're not letting friends know. But 
let let the club know that you're you know if if your daughter gets an offer and the financial thing is an issue clubs can you know um confidentially assist uh, i can't think of a club team that wouldn't um yeah you know and if they aren't then obviously get the hell out of there or, but uh most club teams will will set something up where they would you know they they would love to have the opportunity to help a player play um and there's lots of agencies around too that are working on you know to that end too lots of not for profits that assist so keep that in mind but mm-hmm. um don't want to get too far down that uh, topic, but uh, yeah, I think uh, I think we covered those. That's that's all the questions that's we it? have for today. Yeah, we have nice. a few more obviously that, that come in through our. Like I said, if you have any questions or anything, to our website at uh, volleyballogy.org or uh, info at volleyballogy.org for email mm. uh, or our Facebook page. Uh, feel free to write us in. Uh, we're always uh, we're going to do a few of these episodes. We're going to do some coaches Q and A too. Yeah. Um, yeah, we get some questions from coaches, and we want to talk about strategy and techniques and. You know, defensive systems, offensive systems, uh, yeah. drill ideas, and uh, and again, those videos are coming up too. So, yeah, I think that's about it. So, Meech, anything to add? Maybe closing. Uh... Yeah, Meech. Nope, nothing. Oh, Meech okay. still yeah. not here. Still, uh, again, if you're joining us late, which doesn't make any sense now in the cyber world, but if you jumped right to the end of the video, which <laughs> most people maybe do, um, Meech chose his uh, his own child. Yeah, he chose his own child's birthday over mm-hmm. me and Eric, which I think is inappropriate. Yeah, you know guy acting like he's a family man <laughs> jeez all right anyway uh that's all from us and uh we'll uh we'll catch you next time this was episode 12 hey oh cool all right see you next week later what's the big idea